Welcome to this lecture in the McLean County Area EMS System Instructor Series. In this lecture, we're going to discuss basic presentation skills for the EMS instructor. The objectives and expected learning outcomes for this course include being able to describe and understand different instructional styles, be able to apply basic public speaking skills in the field of pre-hospital education, utilizing strategies that can be used to supplement classroom presentations, and to demonstrate how to gauge students' response to your presentation. First off, why do I care as an EMS instructor about presentation style? The art of teaching often lies in how effectively the teacher is able to present the material, not simply how much, uh, how much knowledge does the instructor have. The method of presentation will greatly impact upon how successfully the material is learned. We've all been in courses over the years as experienced EMS providers in which perhaps we had someone very intelligent presenting the presentation, but because of the style and because of the content and the way it was presented, we came away not really having learned anything. A lot of this has to do with the presentation skills of the specific instructor involved. There are four common types of instructional styles. There's traditional lecture, there's role playing, there is a collaborative slash informal instructional style, and then there's a progressive style. The traditional lecture style is what most of us are most familiar with, as it's the most common form of continuing education and, and in initial education in emergency medical services. Just as with all the different types of instructional style, there are pros and cons. It's very easy to facilitate, and this type of presentation model works well for visual and for auditory learners. However, it's a very poor approach for kinesthetic learners, or those who learn by doing, touching, and hands-on. Also, the primary focus of the traditional lecture is on the instructor. There are some individuals who simply do not feel comfortable uh, being at the center of attention. This does not mean, though, that they that they can't contribute to education um, by participating in some of the other um, some of the other uh, instructional styles. In the role-playing style, this is a very student-centered learning activity. We utilize scenarios, case studies, and practice drills um, as as part of this uh, role-playing um, uh, learning type. This type is uh, really good for all learners, uh, auditory, visual, um, and kinesthetic. Uh, one of the cons, though, is it requires a lot of additional preparation time on part of the instructor um, or the program. When we, when we uh, construct our continuing education program, we have to essentially have it prepackaged, uh, just ready to be delivered. This doesn't mean, though, that instructors can't uh, spend a little bit more time and maybe develop um, some role-playing or uh, develop some scenarios. Occasionally, we will include case studies um, or scenarios or some type of practice drill, and it's really incumbent upon the instructor to be familiar with that material uh, before the first time that they teach the class. In most instances, it requires additional equipment which can sometimes be a logistical challenge, especially if we have multiple courses which are ongoing, um, and it requires a, a fair amount of logistical consideration in shuttling equipment back and forth. The positive in the role playing, though, is that the students are actively involved in the learning process, whereas with the um, traditional lecture, the students take more of a passive approach. In the collaborative slash informal uh, instructional style, once again, it's a very student-centered learning activity, and there's less focus on the instructor. There are team activities, um, and there's an open dialogue going back and forth between the team and the instructor. It's good for engaging students, but it really has to be monitored closely, 
particularly if you've broken them into teams and have them have a discussion within their team. Passive learners may just sit back and let all the active learners do all of the work. Think about a, a course that you've taken, perhaps outside of the realm of EMS, in which there was some group learning um, or a group activity. Most of us probably uh, can recognize that group dynamic in which somebody uh, just kind of kicks back and lets everybody else uh, do all the work, thereby not really getting anything out of the simulation. This type of collaborative and informal learning environment is best focused for small groups. As if you have someone, uh, if you have a larger group, it's harder to keep tabs on who is participating in the discussion and who's not. Um, and it also becomes a, a logistical issue of uh, perhaps uh, too much table talk or um, side conversations. Uh, which can cause the uh, which can cause the room to become quite loud and inhibit the learning environment. The progressive learning uh, style uh, largely deals with distance education. In this type of education, learning takes place while the student is separated from the instructor. This course would be a good example of progressive or distance education. It can take many different forms. Uh, whether it is print correspondence courses, whether it's video-based, internet-based program, and there are several others. The pro is that it allows students to do education on their schedule, not necessarily someone else's. And it also allows for the same consistent message to be put out regardless of which class session of a topic was actually taken. Um, obviously, um, there is some difficulties in maintaining technical competencies which require hands-on validation uh, when utilizing a progressive education model. And as a result, in EMS, we're seeing more and more hybrid education in which there's a mixture of both progressive and then taking a look um, at um, uh, role-playing um, or simulation um, as a hybrid to go along with that progressive education. In terms of making the presentation itself, particularly uh, when we're dealing with a, uh, a traditional uh, lecture style, uh, instructional style, um, it's important to do a couple of things. There's the introduction, there's the outline of the course, if applicable, what any requirements are for successful completion, and then what are the expected outcomes. With the introduction, it can vary if, it, if this is a group that you've taught before versus a group that this is your first interaction with them. If this is a group that you've never interacted with, it's important to introduce yourself. Uh, where do you work? What are your credentials? Essentially, what street experience do you have? Why should people listen to you? Also, if you have any additional training in a particular subject area, such as if you've completed a, a farm medic program and you're doing a training for uh, farm emergencies, that would be something pertinent that would be Im Im important to share. However, and I cannot emphasize this enough, this needs to be done in a professional manner and not in a pompous look at me manner. We've all had those instructors where they think that, um, you know, that they know everything and that they're super instructor uh, because they have all these letters after their name. There is a right way to do this and a wrong way. The next component is give a brief outline of the course, essentially providing a roadmap uh, for where the course is going to go today. Um, there is a, uh, a technique that's oftentimes used in education. Tell them what you are going to teach them, teach them, and then remind them what they should have learned. For most continuing education classes, it essentially only requires them to sit there and listen to the material, um, and there really aren't too many requirements for completion. However, encourage them to be active. It's also important to remember and understand that instructors, even of CE classes, have the authority and the backing of the office to remove and deny credit to those that are disruptive to the course. If you have to do this, please contact the office as soon as possible. Um, if this is an initial certification course that you're teaching, outline what the expectations of the course are, such as any type of clinical requirements, uh, outlining how many exams, what are the passing scores of the exams, 
and then time frames to be able to complete things. If, you're, if you are teaching a system initial education course, all of this information is outlined in the course manual. Expect the course outcomes. Very simply, tell them what they should be able to do after the, the course is over. Um, this is oftentimes included in the actual presentations of continuing education that we create, in addition to the PowerPoint presentations that are provided by the uh, textbook companies, and you should have that tool to be able to help you. Um, it, it's also a good way to be able to prime the student for them to be able to uh, tune in uh, to the uh, most important parts of the presentation. Instructor presence is something that a a lot of new instructors have difficulty with. And that's okay. Every instructor will develop their own sense of style as they become more relaxed in the classroom environment. Watch other instructors, or think back on an instructor that left a positive impression on you as a good example of how to develop your style. Also, the, the, the contrary can be true. You can think about an instructor um, who maybe did not do such a good job, and that can give you a list of things that you might want to avoid. Also, it's important to remember that students won't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. What we mean by that is that you have to behave um, in a manner uh, which presents uh, professionalism, and also you have to behave in a manner um, that your students know that you respect them. Because if you don't respect them, then they're not going to respect you. With continuing education instructors, this interaction can become a strength developed over time, particularly if you teach the same agency on a regular basis. Just because you have a higher licensure level than someone does not entitle you um, to talk down to or to treat them in a disrespectful manner. As an instructor, it's important to arrive early. Uh, by arriving early, you'll appear organized um, and ready to uh, conduct uh, the course. Also, you'll avoid agency administrators and students becoming nervous or agitated as to whether or not the instructor is going to show up. This has been something that historically our system has had an occasional problem with, particularly with continuing education, with instructors not, uh, not showing up. Uh, to the classes in which they agreed to teach. It is extremely important that if a conflict arises, uh, you need to let us know as soon as possible um, so that we can work with you to uh, uh, identify another structure, instructor or uh, be able to come up with an alternative plan moving forward. Also, make sure to check the audiovisual equipment. Do you have everything that you need in order to facilitate the presentation? Do you need speakers? Do the videos play? and etc. When you receive the course materials from the office, if you use your own computer to teach, you should test the presentation to make sure that it works on your particular system. Obviously, if you're going to be using a computer provided by the agency, we won't necessarily have that ability um, to be able to test those items. If you have AV problems at an agency, please let us know in the system office so that we can make a potential change or accommodation for the next time. Very simply, we can't fix what we don't know is broken. Public speaking is a key component of being an instructor, uh, regardless of the topic area. So here are some key principles to help you uh, in terms of uh, understanding the expectations. Always use appropriate language. Avoid overly familiar language like sweetie or honey when addressing your students, as it does not convey a professional attitude. Don't use obscenities even once amongst your peers. It's unprofessional and potentially offensive this day and age. As a result, it's also very important to know your audience. Know who you're teaching. Um, whether that be, uh, you know, what type of agency is it? First responder? BLS? ILS? ALS? Um, you know, are there any uh, specific things within the community? Or are there any uh, political issues that you should be aware of? Make sure to speak clearly and distinctly. Enunciate and place emphasis on key points. Also, vary your volume, pitch, and inflection when giving the course. The same monotone voice can become discerning to students and cause them to tune out. 
we've all had that teacher, whether it was in EMS or in high school or junior high, who talked in a robot monotone voice. Don't be that guy that everybody falls asleep on. A lot of us like to interject a little bit of humor into our uh, teaching style and our presentation, and that's perfectly all right. However, it's important to note a couple of things. Avoid denigrating other professionals. Never use humor to point out a student's mistake. And it also use, needs to be used sparingly. It also should be related and not contradict the material that's being presented. Also, EMS providers themselves are prone to the use of dark humor as a form of stress relief. Be alert to the mood of your students by observing their humor. Also, keep in mind they will model their behavior after your behavior, um, particularly if this is someone that you will teach on a regular basis. Avoid jargon. So it's a fact that EMS terminology uh, is part of our profession, but not everybody is at the same level of learning. So make sure that everyone knows what you're saying by defining every term or jargon or acronym at least once. And this is once again where knowing your audience is key. Am I teaching a, a, a class full of uh, seasoned paramedics who have been around for 15 years? Or am I teaching a group of first responders who just got their licenses? However, even with knowing your audience, it's uh, usually not a good policy to make assumptions as to what your audience knows or do not know. Eye contact is something that's extremely important uh, from an instructor standpoint. We want to make sure that we maintain eye contact with the class by moving your eyes around the group. However, don't lock eyes with someone for too long, as it has a tendency to make some people feel uncomfortable. Also, if space is available, consider moving around the classroom to keep all students engaged and on their toes. In terms of appearance, for system classes, whether it be initial education or continuing education, the dress code is business casual. Polo shirts, dress pants, no shorts or jeans. Um, if you are an uh, instructor, um, the system does provide uh, one polo shirt um, that you can use if, uh, if, if that is something that you desire. You can contact Dylan or John in the system office and we can provide you one. In terms of the dress code, Exceptions can be made for the type of class that's being conducted. Obviously, if we're teaching a lifting and moving class, then perhaps maybe there um, maybe a uh, more athletic clothing uh, might be appropriate for the instructor. It's also important to respect personal space and avoid unnecessary physical contact with students. If space is available, and I know it's not always possible, Try to maintain at least six feet between you and your students. In case you're wondering um, what a, a length of six feet is, essentially both of your arms extended out gives you about a, gives you about a, a six foot uh, a six foot mark. This one really should go without saying, but it's also sometimes one of the most difficult things to do. Treat everyone the same. Engage students on an equal basis. Avoid gender biases. Watch your class close, closely and advocate for students who are outsiders from the group or who are struggling. Avoid picking favorites and don't pass judgment on students. That's not our job as an instructor. So we've mentioned it a couple of times already, but you have to know, know your audience. What type of class are you teaching? Are you teaching an initial education course versus a continuing education course? Are you teaching a BLS agency or an ALS agency? Are you teaching in a rural environment, or are you teaching in an urban environment? While we always have to make sure that the same objectives are addressed to ensure consistency of education, it does not mean that we can't tweak our approach a little bit. Also, observe students' responses to your presentation. Do we see the glazed over eyes look, at, uh, which we usually see when we've completely lost the student um, and uh, things are just going completely over their head? Also, if one student is not understanding, then there's a chance that others are having difficulty as well. Also, 
the same people uh, reading skills that are helpful in the field environment are also helpful in the educational environment. So there are a variety of different learning activities that can be encompassed within a lesson. Each has their own strengths and weaknesses. Some of those include case studies, scenarios, simulations, personal experiences, and then games and entertainment. Case studies can be as simple as a written simulation, or they can be as elaborate as multimedia presentations with photos and radiology results, and even uh, potentially participation by the members who provided care. These can be presented to an individual or to a group of students. Typically, the case studies that we utilize within our continuing education presentation are the simple written simulations for the simple fact that we cannot necessarily uh, get the same individuals who are on a call out to all 43 agencies within the system. Um, however, uh, conducting case studies within your own agency um, can certainly be a, a, a good independent learning activity. Scenarios take on hands-on practice where the students simulate being the practitioner in a given scenario. They take a high degree of pre-planning in order to be effective. It's also important to discuss with the students what the ground rules are and your expectations prior to beginning the scenario. Scenarios can also be written down or can be done as small, as small group discussions. Simulations are probably some of the most valuable, but also the most complex to be able to uh, set up and prepare. So in simulations, we use moulage, victims, and equipment to completely role play a scenario from start to finish. It's actually this type of environment now in which final paramedic uh, testing for the National Registry exam takes place. Simulations can be observed by students or the student can participate. And usually, it's a mixture of the two. Personal experience or war stories can help students develop concrete cognitive images of subject matter and really help them be able to apply the concepts that they just learned. It's important to understand, though, that war stories should not overtake the entire lecture. It's something that should enhance it, not distract from it. Also, when utilizing this modality, don't let the conversation go into non-purposeful discussion with students trying to one-up one another or trying to one-up the instructor. But personal experience can help sow the seeds for great discussion opportunities and can be a means to work on critical thinking skills. Games and entertainment are another uh, potential lesson component. Most adults enjoy playing games, but those games should have some relevance to the course. What we've done in a lot of our presentations is that we've created some form of uh, a game show, such as Jeopardy, as a way to be able to test and quiz uh, in a game environment to be able to see really how effective we were as an instructor uh, in teaching the material. These types, of, uh, these types of modalities can help break the normal routine. Um, however, it is important to note that this strategy won't necessarily be advantageous for everyone. We hope that you've enjoyed this course. Um, it helps provide uh, a basic framework as to uh, how a class should go and, and how we should present a, how we should present a class and a presentation uh, given um, uh, specific criteria. Now this, this presentation only addresses some very key points um, and there is a lot more to learn uh, than this. And as a result, we encourage you to continue to follow our instructor series and to be able to um, you know, pick up on additional uh, points uh, to help make yourself a better EMS instructor. Ultimately, what we hope is that you have uh, become a little bit more comfortable and have a little bit better of an understanding of what the expectations, roles, and responsibilities of an EMS instructor are. It's also important to continue to learn and seek out those other resources. 
Also, uh, if you're still a practicing field provider, make note of any interesting calls and patient encounters that you have. That will be a wealth of information that you may be able to pull from to be able to help your students uh, understand concepts. So we thank you for watching. I uh, hope that you've enjoyed it, and we'll see you next time.